Hey, welcome back to Smashing Pillars TV. I'm Samuel, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the Feast of the Lord. Actually, not all the feasts. I'm going to talk about Rosh Hashanah and uh, the Feast of Trumpets, which basically falls on the same day. Um, but I'm going to, I want to, I want to kind of pick up where I left off in my last episodes on uh, Elul or the month of Elul. And we talked about that. If I'm not going to get into that this time, but you can look at those episodes on my YouTube channel if you want. Or you can go to kbntv.tv and you can watch them there as well. Um, because the feast is just a, it's a, it's an amazing thing that God gave to creation. And so the reason why I want to talk about the feast is because I know a lot of people who follow me don't really know about this. And they think that the feast are the feast of the Jews and things like that. And, but usually when I have an opportunity to share on the feast and the prophetic symbolism behind it and how God gave them to be celebrations. They're, they're God's holidays according to his calendar. Uh, people always get it and they understand and then, and then they wonder why haven't we been taught this in the church? So one of the, one of the things I always say about the feast is that God gave us what, what he calls these appointed times. They're set fixed times every year on God's calendar where he draws near to his people to accomplish a specific work in their life. And I've said this before, I said this in the teaching of Elul, that if you don't observe the feast, will you go to hell? Absolutely not. But this is something that God gave as a blessing to creation, not just the Jewish people. This is to all humanity. And if God promised to meet you at specific times throughout the year to accomplish a specific work in your life, wouldn't you want to be there, right? You, I, I want to be there. I'm always there. and so. That's kind of what this is all about. But let me, let me open in prayer, and then we'll get started. So, Father, I just thank you for, God, thank you for this opportunity to share on your behalf, Lord. God, I pray that your anointing would be on the message, uh, these next three episodes on Rosh Hashanah and the Feast of Trumpets. Lord, I pray that only your words would come forth and, and be sown into the hearts of the people who watch these episodes. Anything that I say that is not of you, I pray that those words would fall dead to the ground and not bear any fruit. In Yeshua's mighty name. Lord, I thank you for releasing angels now. Release angels, ministering spirits to the people. Lord, that they'd be able to understand and that I would be able to articulate your word to them. I thank you for doing all of this in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. All right. So, uh, hmm. okay. So while I was praying, I saw something or I heard something. So let me just share that before, before I get started. So. This may be for one person. This may be for several. Probably, I have a feeling it's for several. Don't, don't be so caught up on missing your destiny. Don't, don't be so anxious that you're running from conference to conference, meeting to meeting, praying and crying out to God that you don't miss your destiny. Don't, you're, you're <laughs> there's, a, there's a secular artist who, who wrote a song and and one of, the, one of the lines in her lyrics says, you're made for now, not tomorrow. Now is the acceptable time. Today's the day. So don't, don't be so concerned about missing your destiny. If you really believe that God orders your footsteps, he'll get you there. Okay? Your destiny is now. What is God telling you to do now? What should you be doing today? That's your destiny to fulfill today. And I used to think that, I used to be concerned about that myself. Am I, am I going to miss my destiny? And, and God, please don't let me miss my destiny. And I had a dream one time that I was, I was in this forest, and there was a long line of people in front of me. And, and I don't know where we were headed, but I just knew I needed to stay in line. Eventually, we came up to a place in the forest where there was this big fence. It was maybe 10 feet high. It was a wooden fence. And there was a guy I could see at the fence helping people. He was cupping his hands and he was helping people over this fence, right? And as we got up and it was getting close to being my turn to be helped over the fence, the guy looked at me and it was Yeshua, it was Jesus. And, 
And I said, hey, Jesus. <laughs> and he said, hey, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm helping people over the fence. Their destiny is on the other side of this fence, but they can't get over on their own, so I'm helping them. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And he said, hey, can you do me a favor? He said, will you stand here and help the rest of these people that are coming over the fence because there's one more fence on the other side and there's no one there to help them to get over that, that last fence. And so I need to go over there to help them. And, and then I'll help them. And on the other side of that last fence is their destiny. And I said, okay. And just as he was about to leave, I said, hey, wait a minute, Lord. What about me? What about when I, change, when I help the last person over the fence? Who's going to help me over the fence? And he looked at me kind of like, like perplexed. He just kind of looked at me sideways and he said, Samuel, this is your destiny. Your destiny is to help people over the fence to go reach their destiny. And so what, what I came from from that dream was my destiny did not look like anything I thought it was going to look like. I didn't even know what my destiny was going to look like, but I knew then that my, my, my job or my destiny what the Lord wanted from me was to actually help people continue in their life. Wherever it was that they were stuck in life, help them over that fence so that they can continue on in their life. Don't worry about missing your destiny. You're walking in it today, okay? And so that's, that's a word from the Lord. All right. So what I want to talk about is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, which is um, the Jewish New Year. And before I get into that, as I was typing my notes up last night for, for today, I had some thoughts, and so I started putting these down. So I want to share these with you. So the Feast of the Lord, and I'll get into this a little bit later on in the teaching, but they, they're the Feast of the Lord. They're not the Feast of the Jews. And you can read that in Leviticus chapter 23. The first time that the word Jew comes up in the scriptures is in 2 Kings 16, verse 6. And it, and it reads this way, at that time, Rezin, king of Syria, captured Elot for Syria, and he drove the Jews from Elot, and the Syrians came to Elot and dwelt unto, there unto this day. That's the King James 2000 Bible. That took place in 733 BC, right around that time. So there were no Jews when God gave the Israelites, that's what they were, Israelites or the Hebrews, uh, the feast to steward at Mount Sinai. All right, so the feasts are also mentioned on day four of creation, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the teaching. They also represent doors, right? Because remember, these, there are seven feasts. I said this in, in, the, in the teaching in Elu. There, there are seven feasts. God draws near, right, during these feasts every seven times a year to accomplish a specific work in our life, and he brings something to completion, right? He brings a cycle. Seven is, the God's, is God's number for perfection. So he brings something to perfection in our life, and then the cycle starts all over again, and we go from glory to glory to glory with the Lord. So the, they, they represent doors that really introduce us to the door, right? Jesus is the way. He's the only way to the Father. Observing the feast is not legalism, okay? There's a difference between legalism and obedience. Legalism is trying to earn favor and blessing from God. Right? You, you, you do all the things that the Bible says so that you can get what the Bible says. Or you, do the, you don't do the things that the Bible says not to do because you're afraid of being punished and things like that. That's legalism. Okay? Obedience is performed with a pure heart and a desire to please the Father and, and the Son, Yeshua. So when you look at the Old Testament through the natural mind, you're going to think legalistic, right? But when you look at the, the law, which is what we call the Old Testament, when you look at the law as a light, the Old Testament gives you greater insight into the mysteries of God. I'll give you some examples. Psalm, Psalm 19, 119, verse 105. Your word or your law is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Right? So if the, if, the law, if, the, if the law is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, then it, it gives you greater vision. It gives you, it gives you a greater perspective of, of what's on the path before you. Right? 
in that same Psalm 165, verse 165 in Psalm 119, it says, great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. You know, one translation says, nothing causes them offense. Great peace have those who love your law, nothing causes them offense. So you see the difference between legalism and obedience, right? The law, the, the word of God is good when it's, when it's looked at through the eyes of the Spirit. All right. So we don't have to go back to sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. The sacrifices we offer today are sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise. That's what God loves. Just a, a few more scriptures about the Old Testament. Because I, I want you to see that what I'm trying to show you is that there's a process. There's a process, let's say, um, baking a cake, right? There's a process to bake a cake. You got to get the ingredients. The ingredients are actually added to each other in a certain order, and you get the final outcome is a cake, right? But if you just, if you take out a couple of the ingredients and you just try to, or you just try to do it all at one time, you may not get the same result. And it's the same thing with, with God's plan of redemption. If you, if you don't know it from the beginning of the process, which is Genesis until Revelation, then you get into stuff that's called like re replacement theology, all right? But let me give you a couple of scriptures about the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through 17. For, what is, for if what is passing away is glorious, or was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. This is Paul speaking. Like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the teaching of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the Torah, right? When Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, when you read that in context... Right? He's saying that when you read the Old Testament, unless you've, you're, you, you've turned to Christ and you read the Old Testament, you're, you're not going to understand it. You're going you're to have this veil on you, over your heart. In other words, you're going to say, well, we're not under the law anymore, things like that. But when you read it in context, the very last uh, scripture that I read there was this. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So in context, he's talking about the Old Testament, so we have to agree that he's saying in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord is there. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, in the Old Testament, there's liberty. Okay? But you can't see that if you look at it through a, a, um, a legalistic filter, is what I'm trying to say. No, next scripture, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful. It's alive and powerful, right? Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when that was being written, some scholars say it was Paul, some say they don't know who wrote it. But when that was being written, there was no New Testament. So we have to assume that he was talking about the Old Testament. And he's saying, remember where the Spirit of the Lord is? That, the, that that's, those scriptures are alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay. Second Timothy, next passage. Second Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy. And he's saying, you, you, you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. And that from childhood, Timothy, from childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul was writing the New Testament then at that time. So the Holy Scriptures that he had to be referring to when he, when he says, Timothy, you've known them since childhood, had to be the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And he says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Okay? I'm not saying do the Old Testament. What I'm saying is don't disqualify it. Don't discard it. 
it's it, it's it it reveals the the New Testament and the and the New Testament reveals the the, the old and the, or they validate each other is what I'm trying to say. All right. And when you when you start to do away with the Old Testament, that's when you get into replacement theology, which basically says that God has rejected the Jews because they rejected Jesus, and so now the church is Israel today. There's so many scriptures that God hasn't even fulfilled yet that, that contradict that kind of a teaching. Okay? God has not done away with the Jews. He has not done away with Israel. He loves Israel. He loves the Jews. And he loves you. And he loves me. All right. So let's see. So, okay. So God, think about this. So God, he chose the Jews, right? They're his, the chosen people, right? You know why he chose them? Because he had to choose somebody. <laughs> he chose them. They're like, he chose like the, the smallest, the weakest, the base to entrust them with his word, teaching, them, teaching everyone his word, his covenants, how to, how to commune and how to walk with Yahweh. Okay, so he had to choose someone, a, a people. That's why he chose the Jews, right? They're just, it's not because they're better than anyone else, okay? And so if you do away with the Jews, then you do away with the covenants of God, these magnificent, genius, amazing covenants that we, we stand on, especially the covenant that he made with Abraham. If you do away with the Jews, you do away with Abraham, and you do away with the covenants because he made the covenants with them, not with us Gentiles, right? We've been engrafted in. So he chose the Jews to be the vehicle that he would bring redemption to the whole world through, through them. They were the vehicle. He, what else? I'll give you a couple other examples. So, so he used the Jews to prepare the world for the coming Messiah. Then he used the Jewish people to, as a womb to literally birth the Messiah into this earth. And it's because of the Jews that he's going to return the second time. So you can't do away with the Jews. Don't, don't get into replacement theology because then you get into anti-Semitism. Then you get into some of the stuff that's all out there that the Jews are behind all the wickedness in the world. And and they're the ones who killed our Lord and Savior, which is, sounds a little bit like Catholicism teaching there. But God sacrificed his own son. He had to use human hands to do it. But Jesus came to die for us. It wasn't that anybody killed him. God sacrificed him. He gave his life of his own self. He, Jesus says it himself. Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. So just don't, I don't want to get on my soapbox about replacement theology. Just don't get into that. It's not good. It'll, it'll set you off on a course that you don't want to go on. <clears throat> Ask me how I know. <laughs> All right, so, so in light of that, think of this. In light of God having to choose someone, he used a, a very, very small nation. In fact, all the nations that were against Israel in the Bible, none of them exist today. Israel still, is still here today. That says a whole lot right there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Wow. That's pretty awesome. It's all about Yeshua. It's all about what he did. But the Jews are the chosen people. They were chosen to steward the word of God, the feast, things like that, they were to teach us. In fact, I'm not going to read that, but you can read it yourself in, in Exodus chapter 19. When he brings them out of Egypt, and he gives them all the, the instructions, the commandments, and all that. And um, so, there you have it. Okay, so the Feast of Trumpets and Rosh Hashanah. It begins this year at sunset on September 18th. That's this Friday, okay? the, the, the Jewish New Year, or God's New Year. And it ends nightfall September 20th. Perfect timing for this teaching. 
So Rosh Hashanah means the head or the head of the year. It's also, like I said, it's, the, it's the, also the Feast of Trumpets as well. So God tells the children of Israel, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. That's Leviticus 23, verse 2. One of the most important uh, things about the Messianic believer's life is the biblical calendar. And I'm talking about God's calendar, not, not the Gregorian calendar that we go by today. The Jewish people are to join in with Yahweh in sanctifying his holy days as they observe them in the manner that he prescribed. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. Included in the oracles of God that they've been given, entrusted to the Jewish people, is the Sabbath and the festivals. As Israel stood at the base of Mount Sinai, Yahweh instructed the Jewish people in his calendar, and he gave the festivals for them to observe and pass on from generation to generation. Paul's commitment toward the holy days could best be summed up in a quote from Acts 18, verse 21. I must by all means keep the coming feast in Jerusalem. This is Paul speaking in the New Testament. So no one, no one questions the validity of Acts chapter 20, 16, which Paul mentions determination, his determination to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. He had actually intended to be there for Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, but circumstances required him to keep them locally. That made him more determined to be in Jerusalem for the next holy day, the Day of Pentecost. And remember, I said this also in the last teaching in, uh, in Elul, the month of Elul, that the feasts are prophetic pictures of Yeshua. He's already fulfilled the first four which is Passover, unleavened bread, feast, uh, the feast of uh, first fruits, and Pentecost, and then you have the last three, which is uh, trumpets, atonement, and uh, tabernacles, which have not been fulfilled yet. And think about this: if he came on the exact day of the first four feasts, he fulfilled those first four feasts on the appointed times that God prescribed. It's safe to say that he's probably going to return and fulfill the last three on the exact day of those appointed feasts. So you wouldn't want to miss that. You, you, you don't want to miss these things. You, these are blessings. These are blessings, not uh, rituals that are le legalistic in any way. And God doesn't have a problem with traditions. He's the, one, he's the one who set the traditions in place. He loves family traditions because he loves family gatherings. That's kind of my take. All right, so Paul, so Paul says, purge out, the, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but, the, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Next passage. So let us let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility. That says Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 18. And I wanted to just throw this last passage in here. This is out of Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. People use this passage to say that Paul was teaching against keeping the feast. But then indeed, when you, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You serve, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you lest I've labored for you in vain. So people will, will try to take this passage and say that Paul was teaching that we don't have to observe the feast anymore, that that's a form of bondage. But when you look at the context, he's speaking to Galatians, and he says right there in that passage, let me read it to you. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God. So they were pagans, right? They never knew God. 
So how could they turn back to something that they never knew? I mean, it's, it makes sense, right? It, so they never, they, never, they never knew God. They didn't know the feast. They didn't know any of those things. So what feast was he talking about? He's talking about the feast to their false gods. And you can, you can, look, at, you can look into that yourself. Go online, do a, do a search on, on the Galatians and, and the feast that they kept, and you'll find that that's what Paul was talking about because they were turning back to worship. They, they, they still were confessing Christ, but they wanted to also confess their other gods that they were programmed. <laughs> that's a key word right there. Well, it's a key word for today anyway. They were programmed into worshiping and serving and, and celebrating these feast days to these false gods. And so don't let anyone tell you through that passage that the feasts are not to be observed by us today. Paul didn't preach against the feasts. The Galatians never knew God, just like I said a minute ago. So they couldn't return to something they never knew. In fact, you know, when Jesus says, and I'm, I'll close with this and we'll pick up in the next episode. When Jesus says in, in the Gospels, don't think that I came to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill it. If you look up that word destroy, it means to put asunder, to separate, right? And you can look it up in the Greek for yourself. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just paraphrasing, but this is what it says. Look it up for yourself. That word fulfill means to properly teach and preach or properly preach and teach. So what he was saying was, don't think that I came to destroy. Don't think that I came to separate the law from you. I didn't come to do that, but I came to properly preach and teach it to you. It is not, it is, it was always meant to be what? A lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Okay. And uh, I think that's amazing. It's amazing. But you know, we, we, we miss these interpretations if you don't do the word study yourself. But when you do these word studies, you discover some amazing things that opens up the scriptures to you in a whole new way, a whole new light. And so with that, I'm going to close. Let me just, uh, let me pray for you. Put your hands up in the air. Wave them. Let the Lord know that you're here <laughs> and uh, receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his rest, and his peace. And by me praying that I've marked you with the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, and he will bless you. I'm Samuel. This is Smashing Pillars TV, and I'll see you in the next episode. Sin has been forgiven.